Well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome. I see we have people still joining, about 130 of us here and others coming, but we ought to make a start because we've got a busy agenda before us. Uh, welcome, my name is Tim Garda. I'm the Chief Executive of the Nuffield Foundation. And first of all, thank you very much for attending this webinar, which is launching the Nuffield Funded Report, the lifelong health and well-being trajectories of people who've been in care. I'd like to welcome its authors, Professor Amanda Sacker and Dr. Emily Murray, who will be presenting their findings and discussing the implications for policy and indeed for practice. We'll also be hearing responses from Victoria Langer, who's the interim chief executive of Become, the organization that supports children in care and young care leavers, from Professor Ingrid Schoon from UCL's Institute of Education, and Josh McAllister, chair of the Independent Review of Children's Social Care in England. And I'm also here today to welcome our chair today, the UK's national statistician, Sir Ian Diamond. And we're really grateful to see Ian for somehow carving out his time to lead us through a discussion of this report. A report which I think is testimony to the depths of insight that the analysis of ONS longitudinal data can bring to one of the most difficult societal and policy challenges we face. So let me, in introducing him, say just a little bit about why this research project epitomizes what Nuffield is all about. We're an independent charity with a mission to advance educational opportunity and social well-being. But we view social well-being primarily through the lens of the experiences of the most disadvantaged and vulnerable in our society. We are a research funder, we're not in any sense a campaigning organisation, but we look to support research whose evidence has a robustness to stand up to the scrutiny of those shaping policy, and can at the same time aid those in the front line of practice, and so be a catalyst to improving people's lives. Our research is focused on three domains of education, justice and welfare, and, the, and at the intersection of all three, invariably, are the pressures pressing down on families and young people. Which brings us to the research being presented today. Because sometimes, when deciding which projects we should fund, one can see immediately the coherence of the research question in the clarity of the title. Looked after children grown up immediately offers that admirably sharp narrative to which one immediately wants to know the outcome. I suppose the term longitudinal studies to those not versed in social science can appear a somewhat arid one. But what we find here is an OMS longitudinal study using census data from over five decades, painting a vivid and complex picture of vulnerable lives and their health and social outcomes that in places brings the reader, quite frankly, up short in shock. Because we've known for a long time that being in care as a child is associated with poorer outcomes in adulthood, but previous research has mostly ended in young adulthood or been based on small population samples. This research, documenting people's lives into their 40s, enables us to understand the longer term health and social inequalities of people who've been in care as children. And researchers' innovative use of the ONS longitudinal study also speaks very much to another of Nuffield's core aims to improve the accessibility and use of data and evidence. And so we must all have a lot to thank the Office of National Statistics for as a repository of the data and evidence that really underpins us as a functioning civil society. And this allows me to introduce our chair for today's event, Sir Ian, because he has, survived, has advised the foundation on many issues over the years and has been our great friend and supporter. He's previously shared, uh, served as a non-executive member of the UK Statistics Authority Board. He was vice chancellor at the University of Aberdeen from 2010 to 2018, who was previously Chief Executive of the ESRC. He is one of the most eloquent advocates for the public understanding of the use of data and for its vital place in education at all levels. A Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, a Fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, he holds a host of honorary degrees. But from Nuffield's point of view, he exemplifies the belief that the careful accumulation of reliable data and then winnowing out of understanding from it is the most powerful tool of emancipation that society can have in forming the policies that can address its most pressing inequalities and problems. So I'll hand to him just in a second, but a couple of housekeeping points before I do. I should explain that all of you attending will not be visible or audible during the webinar. After the presentation and panel responses, there'll be time for discussion and answering your questions. So if you'd like to ask a question to the speakers, please do so by typing it, as always, into the Q&A box. If your question is directed to a particular speaker, please highlight this in your question. 
We've closed captions in English, which you can access by clicking on the CC icon on the screen near the Q&A. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the event, as will indeed the slides from the presentation. So now I'm delighted to hand you over to Sir Ian Diamond. Ian. Tim, thank you very much. It's an enormous pleasure to be here for a number of reasons. One reason is that it is now almost 40 years since I first had conversations with the late, the, the late John Fox uh, about his vision for setting up this data set. Uh, I was an extremely junior academic at the time, uh, and I just thought that John's vision was absolutely brilliant, um, but could he do it? And the fact that we are now, as you say, Tim, five decades on uh, with uh, these wonderful data to, to look at is, I think, incredibly important because longitudinal data are so important, as we will hear uh, from Amanda and Emily in just uh, a moment. Uh, I would also say very simply from ONS's point of view that we are incredibly keen to make ever more of these data and indeed other data sets. And through our secure research service, we're always in the business of looking for opportunities to work with researchers uh, to link data. And some of the things that um, John Fox uh, would have been thinking about, which was almost you know, sitting down with a pen and paper and linking by hand, now we can do uh, in real time uh, and um, have done recently in, in, in the context of some challenges around the pandemic at real pace to deliver real information which has enabled policies which impact on some of the most disadvantaged in society. And among the most disadvantaged in society are clearly those young people and children who have experienced care uh, and uh, care leavers uh, we know empirically have not had great outcomes and it has always seemed to me that we needed better longitudinal data uh, in order to be able to understand the pathways uh, that would help us to inform policy which could improve the outcomes for lifetimes uh, of people who are almost a, a, a set of human capital in our country which is underachieving because they have been let down early in their lives for all kinds of uh, reasons. So it seems to me there's an enormous need for this work. I could, when I heard that Amanda Saka was doing this work, I was just so excited. Uh, she needs no introduction uh, to um, I imagine everyone here, she's Professor of Life Course Studies uh, at UCL uh, and has focused, I mean, just gazillions of brilliant things uh, on social inequalities in health uh, and life course uh, social epidemiology. And she's working and we're going to hear today with Emily Murray. Emily, uh, another brilliant um, researcher who's Senior Research Fellow uh, at UCL and she looks at how individual and area-based socioeconomic characteristics impact across the life course. So I just am so excited uh, to be here today to, to hear about this wonderful work uh, and then uh, we'll get into a good discussion. So without further ado from me, uh, can I hand over to Amanda and Emily? Over to you. Thank you, Sir Ian. Um, before I get started, I'm just going to share my screen. I hope that's okay and clear to everyone. Um, I'd first of all like to uh, mention the other members of the team, uh, Dr. Rebecca Lacey from UCL, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, and Professor Barbara Morn from King's College London. The background to this study before we even got going was, I saw this um, quotation in a Department of Health and NHS England report which said, if we can get it right for the most vulnerable, such as looked after children and care leavers, that it is more likely we will get it right for all those in need. I've been working in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at UCL for many years. 
And we are all obviously well aware of Professor Sir Michael Marmot's work on health equity and his mission for nothing less than a fairer, healthier society. Our own work in the field of life course social epidemiology has also highlighted that inequalities in health cannot be reduced without tackling social inequalities too. And by shining a light on the life courses of children who've had to be placed in care, our aim is to get it right for care leaders. We had four main objectives for the study. The first was to determine whether children in care have different health and social experiences 10 to 40 years later compared to children in parental homes. And the short answer to that is, yes, they do. Secondly, to explore if children in residential care do better or worse than children in foster or kinship care, and if children in kinship care fare better than children in foster care. And the first part of that is, yes, unfortunately, children in residential care do seem to fare more poorly, and children in kinship care fare more favorably than children in foster care. Thirdly, to understand if any care differences vary by gender or by ethnicity and migration status. We didn't find any differences by gender, but there was a complicated story with respect to ethnicity and migration. And finally, to investigate if we can see improving trends in outcomes for cohorts of children in more recent censuses. And unfortunately, the answer to that is no, not really. First, to give you a little bit more about the ONS Longitudinal Study, it's based on the England and Wales censuses, starting with the 1971 census, and then individuals have been followed up every 10 years in subsequent censuses. Some is based on four closely guarded secret birth dates giving a 1% sample of the population of England and Wales. And more people get added from each census if their birthday is on one of those four dates. All census topics are available to researchers to use. But the advantage of the longitudinal studies is that they have data on approximately 1 million sample members over the 40 years of the study. And that makes it possible for us to look at a very small section of society, such as those in care. The LS is also linked to births, deaths, and cancer registrations. And we've used the linkage to births and deaths registers in our study. To start with, we had to uh, get a standard definition of a dependent child over all the years of the longitudinal study. As, so, Practices have changed over time. So our definition was people had to be less than 18 years of age, never married, not living alone or independently. And then we excluded all children who were just visiting the household on the census date. And then we took the ONS dependent children in the 1971 to 2001 censuses and followed them up from 1981 to 2011 and grouped them into four different classes. First of all, those who are in residential care, and that would have been either a children's home or a place of detention. Foster care. Overwhelmingly, foster care meant that children had had a care order, uh, placing them with someone who they were not related to but they could have been placed informally with a friend of the family, for example. Next, kinship care. This was most commonly a grandparent, but it had to be an adult over 18 years of age. And usually this would be through an informal arrangement, but some would have had a care order too. And finally, our parental care group consisted of biological, or adopted children with the same surname as the household, the other members of the household living with one or more parent. We, 
try to cover a wide range of outcomes in adulthood. First of all, on the health side, we had information on self-rated health, long-term illness, and all cause or cause specific mortality. In the domain of education and work, we had information on qualifications, employment status, social class, and long-term non-employment, which here meant being out of the labor force for over 10 years. In the housing domain, we had information on housing tenure, overcrowding, or whether the person was living alone. And finally, in the family domain, we had information on marital status, and for women only, the number of children they'd had and their age at the first birth. Just to give you a feel for the large samples in the longitudinal study, this gives the number of children in each care situation. And we had just over 500,000, just under, sorry, 500,000 children in total in our sample. And residential care has become less common over time and counteracting that kinship care is becoming more common. By 2001, 75% of the children in care were living with a relative at the time of the census. 22% were fostered and the remaining 3% were in residential care. I'm now going to hand over to Emily to present a few of our findings. Thank you, Amanda. Um, the, the next slide. So I'm going to, to dive right in and present the uh, two of our key findings with the, the first key finding that there are, are large inequalities in adulthood for the care experienced. And I'm going to show this through a number of different uh, examples. So next slide. So for example, this figure shows the probability of achieving NVQ three, level three plus qualifications. Um, at, so for the three different follow-up uh, ages, so 20 to 29, 30 to 39, and 40 to 49. And then we look all the way to the left uh, group of bars. You can see this is by parental care, kinship care, foster care, and residential care. So what you see is if um, children had been living with their parents in childhood, they had a 28% probability of achieving this qualification levels. Um, but this is compared to in the residential care group, um, that is only an 11% uh, qualification achievement level. And what you also see is if you go to the older uh, age group follow-ups, the um, probability of achieving these qualifications goes up. So there has been some um, you know, later life education, but that graded inequality by care type uh, remains. So next slide. So this figure show the same um, modeling as we did before for qualifications. Now we're just looking at uh, employment status uh, as the outcome. So the, the first three sets of bars on the left is for the employment category, then unemployed, in, in education and other out of the labor force um, categories. So things like retirement, sickness, disability, et cetera. Um, and we see a similar pattern um, for the employment outcomes as we did for qualifications, the same graded inequalities across care groups at all three different follow-up ages. Um, there's some evidence that employment inequalities reduce with age so it, like, for example, all the way to the left, there's uh, adults in their 20s were twice as likely to be employed if they had been in a parental um, home versus a residential, residential care group. So that's about 70 versus 35% probability. Um, and by the, the 40s, this had reduced to a 70% increased advantage, if you want to say it that way. So I think it's about 83% versus 49% probability. Um, but these are still pretty large uh, inequalities at the older ages. So next slide. And um, now we return to mortality. 
So this figure shows causes of death for those in parental, the orange bars, and non-parental care, the green bars. So now we've collapsed those different care type categories into non-parental care for, for numbers reasons. Um, so all the way to the left, um, you see that those longitudinal survey members who had died, 36% um, of those who had ever been in care died of unnatural, what we're calling, you know, the unnatural category. So this includes causes such as suicide, drug overdoses, alcoholism, car accidents, and assaults. Um, and this is compared to 26% of those who'd been in uh, care, who had not been in care and uh, died of unnatural causes. So quite a large gap in the unnatural um, category. In contrast, people who had not been in, who had been in parental care um, in childhood were most likely to die prematurely from cancer. And that's, so that's the third group of bars there. Next slide. So if we then um, stick with mortality, but we show the relative hazard for all cause mortality. So now we're putting all the causes together, um, but this time by the different cohorts of children. Um, from 1971 through 2001. You see that the risk of premature deaths for those in parental care, um, the orange bars, has actually declined um, over that 30 year period. But disappointingly, the risk of premature death for those who had been in non-parental care has not declined, um, um, might actually be going up. So this inequality in largely preventable deaths has grown from a 30% excess risk in 1971, the 71 cohort, to a 310% excess risk in 2001. And you can see that um, for the later years, the, the error bars are quite larger, so smaller sample size. But I think we could say that this inequality has not reduced with some confidence. So, Next slide. So the last example for key finding one, um, we wanted to give a somewhat positive story. So there seems to be a story of more care experienced adults returning to education later in life. Um, so when longitudinal survey members were in their thirties, differences in being in education emerged for, for if they had been children in the 1991 cohort. So you see that that big difference between the orange and the green bars. And also somewhat in the 40 to 49 year follow-up for the 1981 cohort. Um, showing that care experienced adults were returning to education in 2011. Um, we think this, might, this could reflect the 2008 uh, Children and Young Persons Act. So this um, there is recommended that care leavers in higher education be given a, a minimum bursary um, from their local authority. And there's also other university initiatives for care leavers during that time. Um, but of course, we can't say that for sure or for here, but I think that might be a possibility. So next slide. And the key finding too from this research um, was that ethnic ethnicity does matter. So that the care effects do differ by ethnicity, but not in the way that we originally thought they would. Next slide. So just two examples here. So this uh, is the same figure that was shown earlier for qualifications, but now it's reversed. So we're looking at the probability of achieving less than NVQ3 qualifications by care status and ethnicity. So for all of these um, age follow-up period groups, um, non-parental care, so the green bars, was associated with a higher probability of poor qualifications, but only among the, the white and the South Asian groups, um, not for the black groups. And this inequality story uh, is similar at the age 30 to 39 and the 40 to 49 year follow-ups, maybe shrinking in the white group, maybe widening in the South Asian group for the older follow-up periods, but um, need to look more into that. So next slide. And so this figure is showing um, the same as the previous slide, but for now, occupational social class outcomes. 
So you can see that similar to qualifications, there is no difference in the probability of being in a routine social class occupation for the Black uh, ethnicity group. But white children in care remain socially disadvantaged throughout their adult lives. And despite the lower levels of qualifications in the South Asian group, so that's what we saw on the previous slide, this um, did not translate into occupational social class differences for the South Asian group. So that I'm going to end there. I'll leave you a few moments to contemplate this slide while Amanda, I have, hand back to her to wrap up. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Um, I shall now go on to uh, our third key finding, which is that children of kinship and foster care parents need support too. The pattern of outcomes that we saw suggested a premature transition to adulthood. This is usually measured by the big five transition milestones, leaving full-time education, entering paid employment, leaving the parental home to live independently, forming a committed parent relationship and becoming a parent. In their twenties, we saw all these differences across those markers. First, children of caregivers were less likely to have age 18 or higher qualifications. They were more likely to be unemployed or long-term non-employed. They were more likely to be married and they were less likely to own their own home. And women were younger at the birth of their first child. All these factors indicative of an earlier transition to adulthood. By the time we observed them in their 40s, there was no difference between caregivers' children and non-caregivers' children. So having had this whistle top for tour through a few of our results, <laughs> finally getting on to the conclusions, um, our research clearly shows that child placement matters. There are stark gradients in the impact of different placement types. And the inequalities within the cared for population were as great as the inequalities between the populations in parental care and other care. And we need to understand if where children are placed is adding to their difficulties in adulthood or just signals that more support is needed earlier in their lives. These trajectories not only affect their own individual well-being, but also have implications for society. Secondly, the falling rates of premature mortality in the general population have not been mirrored among care leavers. In fact, almost the reverse. And this is perhaps the most shocking finding we found in, in the whole study. Life course trajectories are not the same for all minority children in care. For example, the fate of migrants to the UK who in care does not mirror, mirror that of ethnic minority children. And one can't take uh, research from one group and attribute it and assume that it's going to be the same in the other. And finally, children of kinship and foster parents past the big five transition milestones to adulthood earlier than other children. And although we found no difference in the measures that we had in their forties, it's quite likely that this could play out later on in their lives and still place them at a disadvantage. I'm now going to hopefully not embarrass Josh too much, but I wrote the report before the independent review of children's social care had been published. And there were so many things about that report that chimed with our research. And I've picked out a few quotes from the report and how they gel with our findings. The first quote is, improving children's social care is not something that national government, local authorities or other partners can achieve on their own. And we also highlight 
that inequalities will only narrow if there's joint working across public and private sectors. Second quote, a focus on kinship is needed to promote and support its use and ensure that more children grow up with carers who already know and love them. And we suggest that these arrangements could be registered with the local authority like other arrangements. And this would allow informal caregivers and care experienced adults to access when needed support from health, education and social care providers as for other children in care. Thirdly, children entering care are not getting the mental health support they need. And we'd add to that, neither do care leavers. Fourth, education can be transformational for children and there's much we can do to support children in care to achieve their potential. And we've seen in our data, the trajectories from education to employment and to social position. Finally, there's much more we can do to help children who have been in care progress to further and higher education, find a job or home, acknowledging it might sometimes take longer than their peers. When we fully concur with this, we found that it does take longer for care leavers. And our findings show that adults who have been in care do go back to education with support when they're in their 30s and 40s. So finally, just to acknowledge the great support that we've been given both by the ONS and the Longitudinal Study User Support Team. They've been invaluable throughout this project. Thank you. Amanda, thank you very much. And uh, Emily, thank you very, very much. Uh, great presentation. I'm going to move without further ado uh, to uh, three um, responses. Uh, and in, I'm not going to spend a long time introducing the, the very, very eminent um, responders that we have simply uh, because I want to maximize the time for questions. So without further ado, our first response is from Ingrid Schoon. Ingrid is Professor of Human Development and Social Policy at the Institute of Education, University College London. Ingrid, over to you. Hello, thank you very much. And a big thank you to Amanda and her team for this tremendous and important work. And also, of course, the excellent presentation and crucial new evidence on the experiences of looked after children. And they show that the plight of looked after children has not improved much uh, over a, a period of 50 years and that typically looked after children fare worse than those who grow up with their parents across a range of outcomes. And I think that is also the strength of the uh, census data to provide information on different outcomes, including that care leavers generally achieve lower levels of educational attainment. They have uh, in their adult years, less privileged socioeconomic circumstances regarding employment and social status, and they're less likely to own their own home. They report poorer health, in particular mental health problems and chronic health conditions. They are more likely to start their family formation early and become teen parents. They're also more likely to divorce. And I think most critically of all, that tend to die earlier. They have a greater risk to die earlier and mostly to unnatural causes. And I think these are all major issues of concern and the evidence provided uh, gives us a strong um, uh, munition for po uh, designing policies to improve the situation of the care leavers, particularly regarding the uh, heterogeneity in experience of care by care type, which is a clear innovation of these studies, showing that, for example, uh, uh, young people who experience kinship care do better than those in foster care or in, uh, in residential care. And um, so I think it is a, a real strong case to uh, support the, or to prioritize the kinship over non-residential care. 
the study also showed that there was no evidence on gender differences in outcomes, which is an intriguing finding. And maybe they can say a bit more about um, why they expect or why they think there were no gender differences, because generally there are these big gender differences in these key transition outcomes. Then the evidence on the ethnic minorities was not as expected another key findings to really uh, illustrate um, that there might be different pathways than are generally accepted, expected. But um, the study shows that white children appear to be more affected by out of home care uh, than um, uh, non white children. But I have a question about the use or controlling for social background factors, because um, it seems to be a problem with using the census data to assess the nature uh, of the background, uh, because there is no way to know whether the socioeconomic data is of the rearing family or uh, describing the birth family or the substitute home. And that makes it difficult to really draw a uh, conclusion. Is it uh, the origin or is it the families they are then growing up with that makes a difference? Another question I had is concerning the context of care experiences in foster families, because foster families appear to be less educated and less likely employed or in high status occupation than other parents. And also their biological or adopted children report poorer health, being out of the labor force or uh, being more likely to be in more disadvantaged social position, uh, uh, particular uh, in early adulthood. And um, so I wonder, is there a case to monitor more closely the home environment in foster care families? And this concerns the capacity of the family to foster, but potentially also issues of abuse and neglect, which we hear now increasingly more uh, about and is now more debated in the discussions. And then, um, but I think one of the crucial findings of these studies, in addition to all these innovations of differentiating between care type and following lives over um, uh, periods of time, is that they can really show changes over the historical context, which also involved policy changes. And I was wondering if future studies could maybe include markers of this context, for example, not only markers for uh, relevant policies that are in place, but also markers of uh, education, employment and health provisions to see if the general increase or decrease in these provisions in time of boom and bust has filtered down to uh, children in care. But an important aspect that comes across in these studies is the considerable level of resilience in care leavers in the long run. Even so, they have toned down this evidence. There is, uh, there is significant evidence of catch up in mid adulthood when significant numbers of care leavers return to get education and uh, to get additional qualification, which might also be a reason behind the apparent upward mobility of care leavers in mid adulthood. So the findings does really highlight the importance of bursaries, in particular for care leavers, and also um, more generally access to good quality education and lifelong learning that support this uh, catch up process. And uh, I think generally also is worthwhile pointing out that while about uh, 40 or 45 percent of the care leavers did not get uh, NVQ level three or plus, uh, a considerable number of care leavers did. And I think that is quite an important finding as well. And another issue that uh, I noticed is that um, those with care experience seem to have fewer children than those who were looked after, not looked after. And I wonder, is it because they wanted to be good parents to their own children and be able to give them the full attention or what might be an explanation for this finding? So I think I have to stop here, but I think there are so many important findings in this report and um, I raised some questions and hopefully they can stimulate the discussion.
Thank you. Hey, Chris, thank you very much. And it's great also to see some really interesting questions coming in on the Q&A. So we'll look forward to that discussion later. But Ingrid, thank you for that. We're going to move on now uh, really quickly to uh, our next uh, response, which is going to be from Victoria Langer. I have to say, I think it is incredibly important that this work is linked in with civil society organisations who do so much uh, to, to, to support um, children with experience of, of care, as we've heard this morning. So Victoria is the uh, interim CEO of Become, which is a charity for children in care and young care leavers. Uh, and I won't say any more, just a maximised time. So Victoria, over to you. Great, thank you. First, I just want to say thank you for involving Becoming a Study. We've been really happy to be involved. Um, we hope that the outcome of this project serves as a call to action for decision makers, that decision makers recognise the lifelong impacts for children in care for, of their experiences and put in place the protections against some of the stark inequalities that children in care and care experienced people are more likely to have faced during their childhood. And we welcome the finding that children should live in the type of care that benefits them most in the long run. We find that far too many decisions about placements for children in care aren't always based on what's best for children or what's in their long term interests. And we all know that decisions made in childhood significantly impact into adult lives. And we welcome the idea that the long term impact should be a key deciding factor in the type of care that children are placed into. We also welcome that the study brings into sharp focus the need for public investment and increased expenditure in the services which make a difference in reducing inequalities across health, education and housing. We know that the care system doesn't exist in a vacuum and as the work of the Child Welfare Inequalities Project and other research shows, wider changes to the welfare system and the funding of public services has a substantial impact on the number of um, families facing poverty and the number of children in care. And this study should act as a wake up call to government that preventing inequalities in adult, adulthood for care experienced people is not only their duty as corporate parents, but also makes clear financial sense. Early failures to support children and their families have an enormous future in human and economic costs, both individually and collectively for our society. And I know Josh is speaking next. And Josh, as the chair of the Independent Review of Children's Social Care, and become, we implore you to articulate the need for investment in the reviews for future work and as you progress. We think it's really important that there's a clear case made for greater mental health support for care leavers into adulthood. Lots of young people tell us that the only time that they find the space to reflect on their childhood experiences is after they've left the care system. But by then, they no longer have access to CAMS or to other professionals who could help provide mental health support. They talk to us about some of the traumatic experiences from before and during care, catching up with them when they become adults, but by then they're left without a network of support to help them heal. It's also great that the report highlights the importance of a supported move into early adulthood. The care system's current obsession with an abrupt transition to independence at 18, described to us by young people as the care cliff, has got to end. Overnight, young people are told to utilise their independent living skills without the support and guidance they were entitled to before. And it's an approach that just doesn't exist or just it just doesn't happen to 18 year olds not in the care system. The introduction of stay and put has been a positive development, but children in residential care continue without the same legal entitlement. The government's current formalisation of separate national standards for supported accommodation risks even further accelerating the forced transition into adulthood demanded of thousands of young people each year. And at become, we believe that the current apparatus of leaving care is a dereliction of the duty which the state has as a corporate parent to those children in care. And so we're excited about the potential of the independent review of children's social care to advocate for something brand new. And we welcome that it's asking the big question of whether leaving care should actually even exist at all when imagining the future of children's social care. And finally, despite the stark reminders of the impact of care experience and particularly the differential outcomes across the care settings, it's really important not to fall into the fatalistic trap that children in care are destined to fail or that children with residential care experience are inevitably going to pay, face poorer outcomes. We know it's not true, and we know it's not true because of the incredible care experience people we speak to every day who go on to achieve amazing things and flourish in adulthood. We often hear from young people that despite their power, the overuse of group level statistics on their outcomes can rob them of their agency and their individual stories and their personal aspirations. 
And as such, when we speak to young people or to professional or government official or a minister, and whenever we communicate the need for urgent change to the system, which isn't providing the support it needs, we should do this by providing the by highlighting the statistics, as well as identifying the key successes which create positive and happy experiences for care experienced people into adulthood. The two lenses aren't mutually exclusive, but combined they give us the best vision for what needs to happen and help us to work as allies alongside those with lived experience of care to bring about the change required. Thank you very much, Victoria. That was great. And without further ado, going to push straight on to Josh McAllister, who has been referred to by a number of our previous speakers. Josh uh, is the founder of Frontline, which is a social work charity working to ensure that all children have a safe and stable home uh, in, in England. Uh, and he's just led, as we've heard, the independent review of children's social care. So, Josh, over to you. Thanks, Ian, and thank you for the, the invitation to join the conversation today. This research has already informed uh, and significantly helped the independent review of children's social care, uh, and we're only four months in, so uh, the work couldn't have come at a better time. Um, and I just want to say a huge thank you to Amanda uh, and Emily and their team for um, pulling this groundbreaking study together. Groundbreaking in the truest sense that it is actually breaking new ground in our understanding of where care experienced people end up in later life. Um, and the reason why that is so important for the work that the Independent Review of Children's Social Care is doing is that we're asking a big question, which is how do we better guarantee um, that children can grow up in families where they've got safety, stability and love and where that's not possible, that care can provide those same foundations as I said a moment ago, we're only four months into the review. We've published our uh, case for change, which is setting out the, the big issues that we see within the children's social care system. And we're planning to conclude the review in spring of next year, 2022. Many of the outcomes that um, we discuss in that document and actually are in, are in um, the, the, the public discussion about children's social care focus on um, a much nearer horizon when it comes to well-being um, destinations and health for looked after children and care experienced adults, often focused on um, young people who are still children um, or um, people in their 20s. And I think that the, the work that Emily and Amanda and the team have done is allowing us to extend that view much further forward to see what the, the lifetime impacts are of care. And one of the questions that we, we pose within the, the, the document that we published a few weeks ago is how many parents don't know where their own child is at 30, 40 or 50. And uh, you know, it's a common refrain that um, children in care um, are in uh, the care of the state. The state is the corporate parent and actually not knowing some of these really basic things about destinations and outcomes for care experienced people later on into life um, has been a, a, a huge blind spot. So the study is um, very significant in that respect. Um, and as Amanda highlighted, it, there are a number of themes which cut across um, the work that, um, that the UCL team have done and um, the independent review. Um, first of all, the importance of lifetime loving relationships that ground people, that give them a sense of belonging and provide the fabric of a, of a good life. In thinking about care, um, too often I think the system at the moment thinks about how to provide um, relationship as a service rather than a service which helps build relationships that can last for life. Um, and so that's one of the really big questions that we'll be asking in the, in the independent review and, and building some recommendations around. The study also highlights the long term um, well-being impacts for children who've been in residential care. Um, and so I think we must be really thoughtful about the role and intention of residential care. What's its role within uh, the range of options for children um, uh, and where they live? Um, and similarly, the valuable role that kinship care can play and how too often we overlook the support that needs to be provided to those arrangements. And I think without attributing causality um, and being very careful about that, those are two areas that we will be very keen to explore um, before making recommendations as part of the review. And I guess most broadly, care must nurture, the care system must nurture and strengthen existing relationships in children's lives. 
and help to build new lifelong loving relationships where there aren't enough of them for children. And too often the current system we have actually weakens um, already quite shaky relationships. Um, and I, I, I would um, I, I would say with some confidence, and it'd be interesting to maybe get into this in, in the discussion time that we've got, suggest that entering adulthood without that strong web of loving connections about people who care for you and people you care for around you in your life um, would make it extremely challenging for anybody to um, have the, the destinations and well-being that, that I think all of us would want for our own children. So the headline recommendations in this report, I think therefore are highly relevant to the problems that we've identified in the, the review so far. And I'll just finish by saying that the depth of inequalities facing care experienced people is a um, it's a burning moral issue. If there were any other groups of um, people where these were the sorts of outcomes, particularly in terms of mortality that we could see, um, there would be a, an almighty um, political uh, interest in it. And we need that same level of focus and commitment to um, addressing these inequalities now. So uh, thank you to the team for this um, really important work and for hosting the event today. Josh, thanks. And uh, I think your points are well made that this is an area that sometimes is not well known enough. Now, look, I've managed to find three extra minutes for discussion by not making any final remarks myself. Uh, but we are still a bit tight for time uh, and there's some great questions being coming in. Uh, so I'm going to get through as many of them as I can and inviting Amanda and Emily to to be um, as uh, clear and uh, but a little brief in their responses so that we can get through uh, as many. So uh, Amanda, Emily, thanks so much for this great, uh, great um, responses from Ingrid, Victoria and from Josh. And now Martin Barrow asks, are you able to adjust for how long children have been in care? i.e. what difference does it make if a child is in care from infancy compared to a child who comes into care at age, say, 15? Um, we can't tell exactly how long people have been in care, but we were able to look at whether children were in care in two consecutive censuses. Of course, they could have gone in and out of care in the meantime, but we did find some differences there. and. Um, it's, that's in the report, if you want to go to the report and, and see that. Thanks, Amanda. Now, Lucy Hughes asks, could I ask how the study took into account multiple placements for one child? For example, a child living in kinship, foster and residential throughout childhood. Well, it's a, a similar sort of problem, really, because we only have 10 year snapshots. We did take account of any experiences being different across 10 years for children who are in care in early, uh, observed in early childhood and then in later childhood, we took account of whether they were, they changed their situation over time. But as I said, it's just every 10 years, it's, it's an indication. Now, the two questions, one from Julian Schofield and one from Joanne Alper, which both uh, speak to um, abuse. Uh, Joanne asked, could I ask if impact abuse and trauma was taken into consideration? Uh, uh, and uh, Julian asks, for care leavers, should we be talking uh, about children abused in childhood in their birth families? Are poor outcomes a consequence of care or care not being able good enough to reverse the impact of early abuse in all cases? Amanda. Um, unfortunately, in this study, we weren't able to look at that type of thing. Um, we would very much like to be able to add that perspective of looking at what's happened to children before they enter care, because then we can only really see what the care experience itself is doing. So we, we're quite clear in the report that we're not saying it's the care system that has done all the damage to children who have been abused. Um, we're not able to separate those two things out in this work. It's a first step. There needs to be more research. Brilliant, thanks Amanda. Now, uh, Rick Hood asks, there is a steep social gradient among children accommodated in care. How did the analysis adjust for this, particularly in the comparison with the general population? 
you want me to take that one on? Um, so we could look at what the social class was of the other people in the household. So, so everyone who's in a household fills out the census information. So if they were living with their parents, it then was adjusting for the social class of the parents. Um, the only disadvantage was if they were in residential care, then we don't have information on that. So it's essentially adjusting for social class of the other people in the household they were at during the census. If, if I can add in as well, um, in some subsequent analyses I've done since writing the report, I've, for those children that are in different experiences, so perhaps with their parents and then went to care, I've also looked at the social position and their employment status and so on before they went into care and we get exactly the same results, they've, they've changed very little. Great, um, now Paul Bywaters starts by saying brilliant and really important study, thank you, and I think we'd all uh, concur with that, with that statement, and then asks uh, were the outcomes in adult life controlled for the social class or socioeconomic circumstances of the children in childhood? Were you able to control for the social class position of foster care and kinship care families? How many do you want to? <laughs> I think it's the same, so somewhat. So they could control for the social information of the parent, of the people they were in the household with at the time of the census. But then if they were living with non-relatives or residential care, then we wouldn't know the information about their parents before. So it's a similar answer to the other question. Now, I'm going to take, I've got one more question and we could go on for a long time. And then I'm going to go back to Amanda and Emily and just say, if there's, you know, give them one minute to uh, respond on anything they want to talk about uh, to finish with. And the last question comes from Stephanie Dobler. Um, and I wanted to pick it up because it looks at ethnicity. Uh, and uh, thanks to you for the amazing seminar, uh, which I think, again, we'd all agree. Um, and then questions. I wonder, read the ethnicity finding, the likelihood of being in a lower socioeconomic position, that the differential by care leavers versus non-care leavers holds only for whites but not black group. Could this be due to the fact that the black population is already much worse off on average at baseline uh, and refers then to Yajun Li's research? So care experience does not add to an added disadvantage. It's an important question. Absolutely, that's exactly what we say in the report. We're not saying that uh, black children aren't disadvantaged at all. We're saying that they're already disadvantaged and even if you haven't been in care, you're disadvantaged compared with white children. So it's the, what we show is the contrast between being in care and not being in care, given that your ethnicity. So, um, as I said, there's no additional disadvantage to black children from being in care, whereas there is an additional disadvantage from being in care if you're white. Look, we've got through as many questions as I could get through. Fantastic questions, thanks to everyone. We will make sure that questions, um, all of them, but particularly those that we haven't had time to get through, get to Amanda and Emily, and they might want to just uh, you know, respond uh, in a way that could get up on the um, the video or whatever one calls it these days that will come up afterwards. But before we finish, um, Amanda, Emily, the floor is yours for um, 35 seconds each uh, to, to anything you finally wanted to say. Emily, I'll let you go first. I mean, I, I mean first of all, to thank you to Nuffield for, for hosting this event and for being so support, supportive of the research project. Um, and lastly, I mean, I want to say thank you to, to Amanda because this was her, her idea um, and She's brilliant to work on this project with. And I think it was a very complex, you know, project. Um, and she was always there to, to guide and lead. So thank you. Well, that's very kind of you. I mean, what I would like to say is this has been an incredibly challenging project. It's been challenging on a statistical front, but it's also been challenging emotionally, if you like, that we were dealing with a difficult topic and we weren't always telling good news. And I fully take on board Ingrid's 
and uh, Victoria's comments about how a lot of children do thrive, we presented findings in the report using sort of the probabilities and it's worth taking account of those because even when we find things are worse, sometimes the probabilities aren't that high. So a lot of children are still doing well in adulthood. And maybe, you know, we didn't emphasize that particularly in the report because we were just, con you know, sort of for brevity, we were concentrating on the differences, but it is worth bearing in mind that plenty of children do do well. Amanda, Emily, thank you so much. Uh, and also thank you to Ingrid, Victoria and to Josh. But most importantly, thank you to everyone who spent some time this morning. It's an incredibly important topic uh, and one which um, really does deserve real hard research and hard policy thinking. Uh, and thank you to Nuffield for enabling us all to be here. But finally, a round of enormous virtual applause to Emily and Amanda as thanks uh, for a great seminar. Thank you very much. <laughs>